Let's pray. Father in heaven, it is with reverence and with awe that we approach your holy throne today. As we open your holy word, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that you will give us understanding, for we're going to study a very important subject about the hour of your judgment. And so, Father, help us to understand, not only theoretically, but help us to understand the importance of what we're going to study. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin our study today by reading the passage that we've been studying the last few sessions. Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7. We've studied ten great facts about the three angels' messages. We've studied uh, about the everlasting gospel. We've studied what it means to fear God. And in our last session, we discussed what it means to give glory to God. Now, today, we're going to study about the hour of God's judgment. It says in Revelation 14, verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, and now you have two imperatives, Fear God and give glory to Him. Now the question is, why should we fear God and give glory to Him? It continues saying, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Now that word for there is what is called in the Greek language a causal conjunction. And it should be translated because. In other words, fear God and give glory to Him because the hour of His judgment has come. And then we're told the third imperative, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So you see, the reason why we're supposed to fear God and give glory to God and worship Him is because the hour of His judgment has come. Now, when most people think about the judgment, they think of the judgment as an event. But really, in the Bible, the judgment is not an event. The judgment is a process, a rather extended process. In fact, the book of Revelation itself presents three different and distinct phases of the judgment. I'm not going to go into all of these phases. I'm just going to give you the references. The first phase of the judgment takes place before the second coming of Jesus, before the close of probation. We find that in Revelation 14 and verses 6 and 7. The second phase of the judgment takes place during the thousand years, during the millennium. And you can find that in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 4 through 6. The third phase of the judgment takes place after the millennium, after the thousand years. And you can find a reference to that in Revelation 20 verses 13 through 15. In other words, the judgment is a process. The judgment is not an event, a punctual event. Now the stage that we especially want to take a look at today as we study this subject of the judgment is that first stage that I mentioned. The stage that occurs before the second coming of Jesus, before the close of probation. Now, in order to understand this particular phase of the judgment, the first one, which is mentioned in Revelation 14, verse 7, we need to go back to the story of creation. And you say, well, why do we need to go back to the story of creation? Very simply, because the first angel's message calls us to go back and talk about the Creator. You know that the first angel's message says, Worship Him who made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of waters. So in other words, the first angel's message itself sends us back to the story of creation in order to understand the judgment. So we have to go back to Genesis and talk about the origin of man. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. It's speaking here about the creation of man. And I want you to notice the description. There are several elements that we're going to underline here. 
And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now it's the physical nature of man that is composed of dust or of clay as Isaiah 64 verse 8 says. It says God is the potter and we are the clay. Our physical nature is composed of clay. But even after God made this perfect body originally without sin, the body was without life. I didn't say that it was dead. It was lifeless because there was something lacking. You see, only having the body of matter perfect with all of its parts did not mean that the body was alive. And so God had to do something to that body. Notice what he continues saying. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Uh, another way of saying that is he breathed into his nostrils the energizing force the electrical force, if you please, and man became a living soul or a living being. Now there are several things that I want us to notice about this verse. First of all, man was created with a material body, a body composed of matter. And of course in the head of that body was the brain, the center of operations of the body, if you please. The brain is that organ that processes everything that comes in through our five senses. In other words, our, our eyesight, our hearing, our touch, our smell, our taste, everything that comes in through the five senses is processed by the brain. And the brain, of course, is a physical organism as well. It's also composed of matter. But I want you to notice that the body with this processor, the brain, did not function until God plugged the body in, so to speak, into the electrical source, which was given, giving the body and the brain the capacity to function. And so when God created the body with the brain to process all of the functions and gave that body with the brain the electrical force, the Bible says that man became a living being, or other versions say a living soul. Now up till here, uh, you say, okay, that's fine, uh, we already knew this. But now I want to uh, emphasize something that is extremely important. As Adam, and let's take Adam as our example, as Adam lived after he was created, from the moment that he was created, he now begins to process the information that comes through his five senses and he begins to form his own self-identity. You know there are not, no two people in this world that have the same self-identity because everybody has different information coming through the five senses that is processed by the brain. So taking Adam as an example, Adam lived to be 930 years. Let me ask you, do you think that Adam had a much more complex self-identity when he died at 930 years than the day that he was created? Absolutely. He had his own individuality. He had his own self-identity, if you please, which was different from the self-identity that anyone else had. In other words, during those 930 years, he formed his self-identity, or we could also call it his character. Now we need to ask the question, what happened when Adam died? In fact, what happens when all of us die? Notice Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7. This is a famous state of the dead verse. It says there, when a person dies, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So you'll notice that when a person dies, it says that the body returns to the dust, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. But now I'm going to ask you a question that perhaps nobody has asked you before. What happens with the self-identity or with the character that we formed during our lifespan? For example, what happened to the 930 years of self-identity that Adam formed or the character that Adam formed during 930 years when he died? You say, well, pastor, that's kind of a strange question. I'm asking that question for a very specific purpose, as you're going to see as we study along. The fact is, folks, that the self-identity of Adam was actually recorded by God 
in heaven as Adam lived his 930 year life. In fact, our self-identity is written by God in heavenly books as we live every moment of, of every day. So when Adam died, all of the record of his life was preserved in the heavenly records. In other words, God had an exact perfect record of Adam in his heavenly books. And you say, does the Bible teach such a thing? Well, let's read several verses that speak about what is contained in the books. You see, God keeps records in heaven. He keeps an exact record of who I was during my life, who Adam was during his life. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Let me ask you, does God keep a record of the good and bad things that we performed while we were alive? Yes, and we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So our actions are recorded in God's heavenly books. Now what about our words? Notice Matthew chapter 12 and verses 36 and 37. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. Here Jesus is speaking and he says, But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Is a record of our words kept in God's heavenly records? Absolutely, because by our words we will be justified, or by our words we will be condemned. But I want you to notice that also our secret things are written there. You see, God has a record not only of the outside, He has a record of the inside. In other words, notice Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verses 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12 verses 13 and 14. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all, for God will bring every work into judgment. If God is going to bring every work into judgment, must He have a record of every work? Of course. It says, God will bring every work into judgment, and now notice this, including every what? Every secret thing, whether good or evil. So God keeps an exact record of everything concerning our life inside and out. Let's read also Revelation 20, and verses 12 and 13. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 12 and 13. It says there, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. Notice this, books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written, where? In the books. So I want you to notice that you have books, plural. Now when the Bible speaks of books in the plural, it's talking about the record of our lives. You see, every breathing moment, God is taking a movie, if you please, or He's taking a picture of every single thing that we're doing, every thing, single thing that we're thinking, every single thing that we're feeling, every intention and motive that we have. God is uh, recording a perfect record of every aspect of our lives. Let me illustrate what I mean. Jesus today is personally in heaven, isn't he? He's in heaven in person. But do you know where he is on earth? On earth he is written in 66 books, the Bible. Because the Bible is a written revelation of Christ. That's why the Bible says that Jesus is the Word in person, but also the written Word is the Word of God. Because the Bible is the transcript of the character of Jesus. It's Jesus in written form, if you please. Now with us, it's just the opposite. We are physically and personally on earth, but in heaven we are written in books. In other words, we are written in books where we are not personally. Are you understanding what I'm saying? What I'm explaining, or I'm trying to explain, is that the heavenly books contain a complete biography of each one of us. Every act, every word, every motive, every thought, every emotion, 
Even every opportunity to do good which we did not take advantage of is found written in the books. There is a complete record of our lives inside and out. In other words, God has another Steve Bohr in written form in heaven, and I walk personally here upon planet Earth. Now, I believe that if God was revealing His truth to the prophets today, He would probably not talk about books as containing the records. In biblical times, you know it was common to preserve records in scrolls or in books, but if God was speaking to a prophet today, I believe that God would be speaking about video cameras, and He would speak, uh, speak about DVDs and MP3s, and He would speak about computers because it's a much more sophisticated way of storing and retrieving information. Now, the Bible then, when it speaks about books, is referring to the exact transcript of our lives which God keeps in the heavenly records. But the Bible also uses the word book singular. Now let's take a look at the references in the Bible that use book singular. Go with me to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking about some of his collaborators, some of the individuals that were helping him in his ministry. And he says there, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, he even mentions one by name, Clement also, and the rest of my fellow laborers, whose names are in the what? Book of life. Book singular. What is it that the book contains? The book contains names. What do the books in plural contain? The exact transcript of the person's character. Notice Revelation 3 verse 5. Still talking about the book singular. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Once again, the book singular has what? Names. Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. There are many verses. I'm only reading a sampling of them. Revelation 13 and verse 8. Speaking about those who, who are going to end up worshiping the beast, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names, notice names, have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And you remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai and God said, I'm going to destroy Israel and I'm going to choose another people because these people are idolatrous. Notice in Exodus 32 verses 31 and 32 what Moses said to the Lord. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a god of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. And in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 where it speaks about the final deliverance of God's people at the end of the time of trouble such as never has been seen, we find the following words. Daniel 12 verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written where? In the book. So are you understanding the difference between books and book? The books contain the exact transcript of our lives in written form in heaven. Nothing is missing. Words, thoughts, emotions, motives, actions, you name it. Everything is there inside and out in the books. But the book singular contains names. And the Bible emphasizes that the book contains the names of those who have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now I want us, in the light of what we've studied about the books and the book, I'd like us to take a look at several interesting details about the judgment. The first thing that I want us to notice is that everyone must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. No exceptions. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 once again. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. How many people are going to have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account for what they did while they were in the body, which means while they were in this life? Every single person is going to have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. But now there's another very interesting detail. And that is that that judgment takes place in heaven. What? You're saying, uh, does that mean then that we have, we have to go to NASA and we have to get on a rocket in order to appear before the judgment seat of Christ? Well, let's notice what the Bible says. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place. Daniel has seen something in vision. And the Ancient of Days. Who is the Ancient of Days? God whom? God the Father. Where does the God the Father live? Our Father which art in heaven. Okay. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Who are those? Angels. And then notice, the court was seated and the books were opened. What do the books contain? The record of the lives. Where does this judgment take place? It takes place where the Father lives, where the angels are, according to Scripture. So everyone must appear, and the judgment take pl takes place where? It takes place in heaven. Now let's notice another detail about the judgment. Go with me to Revelation 14, which we started our lecture with. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Let me ask you, does the judgment begin after Jesus comes, or at the moment Jesus comes, or does this judgment of God's people, those who are written in the book of life, does it take place before the close of probation and before the second coming of Jesus? It takes place before. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor. Where does the Bible say that? Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Let me ask you, if the gospel is being preached, must the door of probation still be open? Absolutely. You wouldn't preach the gospel if the door of probation had closed. So you have this angel, he's preaching the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, and he says with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment shall come. It doesn't say the hour of His judgment shall come. It says the hour of His judgment has come. Let me ask you, does the judgment take place while the gospel is being preached? Absolutely. And, and listen to what I'm going to say. Only after the three angels proclaim their messages do you have Jesus seated on a cloud with a sickle on, in His hand to harvest the earth. Which means that the three angels' messages are preached and then you have the coming of Jesus to harvest the righteous and to harvest the wicked. In other words, the judgment takes place before the close of probation. It takes place before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you, when will a person receive the reward that was determined in the judgment when their name was examined? Notice Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. Matthew 16 verse 27. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels. What event is that describing? Second coming, yes. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then He will reward each according to His works. So when is the reward given? When Jesus comes. When are they judged? Before Jesus comes. Are you understanding me? Notice Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Revelation 22 and verse 12. Here Jesus is speaking and He says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. So when Jesus comes, He brings the reward. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to His what? According to His work. Now I know the question that you're asking. If the judgment is in heaven, 
before the second coming of Jesus. How can everyone appear before the great judgment seat of Christ if we live on planet earth? Well, let's ask another question. Very important one. Where are the dead between the time when they died and the time when Jesus comes to reward them? Let's go to John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29. Folks, we're going to notice here that's a very close connection between the state of the dead and the judgment. If you misunderstand the state of the dead, you're not going to understand the judgment. And if you misunderstand the judgment, you're not going to understand how people are during the interim of death. Now notice John 5, 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in heaven or in hell will hear His voice. Uh, yeah, okay. You say, where is that? Well, that's the revised Bohr version. Doesn't count. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are where? In the graves will hear His voice and come forth. When is it they're going to come forth? When Jesus comes. When do they receive their reward? When Jesus comes. When were they judged? Before Jesus comes. So did they go before God's judgment seat, before the second coming? Absolutely. But how could they if they were dead in the grave? Ah, we're going to study something very important here. And so it says, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Now folks, I believe that in order to explain how people can appear, how dead people can appear before the judgment seat of Christ, before the second coming, you know, most Christians think, well, what's going to happen is that the soul of those people are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that the individual must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. How can they appear if they died in Christ, or even if they're alive on planet earth before Jesus comes, before the close of probation. The fact is that we must understand what we started our study with this evening. You see, when the Bible speaks about the spirit that returns to God, it's more than just the capacity to breathe. It's more than just the energizing force that returns to God. You see, as we live, we develop our own self-identity, do we not? And God, what does God do when we die? He preserves that self-identity where? In the books. In other words, he, he writes in the book, in the books, the end, and He closes the books. In other words, He's preserving the record of our lives. He's not only, He's not, you know, some people say, well, you say the Spirit returns to God. Does that mean that God grabs every, everybody's, uh, everybody's breathing? No, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about God preserving the record of our lives. Now, I want to read several texts. Luke 8, verse 52. This is a very interesting story. And uh, make sure that you follow along and tell me if I'm reading wrongly. Luke 8, 52 to 56. Speaking about the death of a little girl. Now all wept and mourned for her. But he said, Do not weep. She is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. And now notice. Then the Spirit returned. It does not say the Spirit. It says her Spirit returned. Let me ask you, what, what was returned to her? Only the capacity to breathe? No, the capacity to breathe along with her self-identity. Are you with me? That God preserved before she died. Notice what he continues saying. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. Notice Acts chapter 7, and beginning with verse 57. This is talking about the martyrdom of Stephen. Acts 7, verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and rap, ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. 
And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. I want you to remember these two individuals. We're coming back to them at the end of the presentation today. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive the Spirit. It doesn't say receive the Spirit. He's saying, receive my Spirit. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Receive my Spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I love that. He fell asleep. Doesn't say he died, although he did die, we know. But it says he fell asleep. Notice one further example. Luke 23 and verse 46. It's talking about the death of Jesus Christ. Luke 23 and verse 46. It says, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend the Spirit. No, that's not what it says. Into your hands I commend what? My Spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now let me ask you this. Do you think that when Jesus resurrected, he remembered everything that had happened while he was alive before his death? Do you think he remembered the names of his disciples? Do you think he remembered when he was arrested? Do you think he remembered when he calmed the storm? Do you think that he remembered when Peter denied him? Of course he did. Why did Jesus remember all of those things when he resurrected? Because folks, when God returned to Jesus, his spirit, he not only returned the capacity to breathe or the energizing force, he also returned to him the record of his life which God had preserved. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Critically important. Now I want to read you an interesting statement. Uh, this statement is in the devotional book, Maranatha, page 301. You see, the author caught uh, this nuance that I'm sharing with you today. This is what the author says in the book Maranatha, which is a devotional book. Our personal identity is preserved in the resurrection. Is that biblical? Of course it is. Uh, let me ask you, am I going to resurrect Gene Hobbs? Am I going to be Gene Hobbs when I resurrect? Am I going to be Rick Perez? No, I'm going to be Steve Bohr. Because God is going to return to me the record of my life with the capacity to breathe. So she says, our personal identity is preserved in the resurrection, though not the same particles of matter or material substance as went into the grave. The wondrous works of God are a mystery to man. And then she says this, the spirit, the character of man, is returned to God there to be preserved. What is it that's preserved? The spirit or the character. Our self-identity. Who we were in life, in other words. She says, in the resurrection, every man will have his own character. In other words, your own life record. God in his own time will call forth the dead, giving again the breath of life and bidding the dry bones live. The same form will come forth, but it will be free from disease and every defect. It lives again bearing the same individuality of features so that friend will recognize friend. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Now, there was a, there's a statement in the book of Job that used to puzzle me. It sounded pretty selfish. It sounded like Job was the only one that was going to see the second coming of Jesus. Notice Job 19, 25 to 27, and I'm going to read from the New International Version where the translation is more forceful. Job 19, verse 25. Here Job is saying, in the midst of his suffering, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. This is talking about the second coming. In the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh... I shall see God, I myself will see Him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. So nobody else is going to see the second coming of Jesus except Job. He says, I and not another. What is, he, what is he saying? What is Job saying here? He's saying that when I resurrect, I'm going to be whom? I'm going to be Job. Job is going to see the Lord. Rick Perez is going to see the Lord. Dr. Teske is going to see the Lord. All of us are going to see the Lord as individuals that we were during our life. Now let me ask you, applying this after the millennium. After the millennium you have the resurrection of the wicked, right? Let me ask you, do the wicked resurrect righteous? 
Of course not. How do they resurrect? Just as wicked as they were? Let me ask you, do they begin at the same spot where they left off? Absolutely. They surround the holy city. They're just as wicked as ever. Why? Because God is returning to them the identity that was saved in the books. Are you following me? Allow me to read you another statement from my favorite book on Bible prophecy. This is a classic. It's the book that has the clearest perspective of Bible prophecy anywhere in the world. It's called The Great Controversy. Notice about after the millennium uh, what the author has to say. Speaking about outside the city, there are kings and generals who conquered nations, valiant men who never lost a battle, proud, ambitious warriors whose approach made kingdoms tremble. Now notice this, in death these experience no change. As they come up from the grave, they resume the current of their thoughts just where it ceased. In other words, if somebody, if somebody was, you know, opened their mouth and half a word came out, and somebody shot them, when they resurrect they complete the word. Because they resume the current of their thoughts just where it ceased. They are actuated by the same desire to conquer that ruled them when they fail. Let me ask you, why is it that they resurrect in this way? It's because God is not only returning to them the capacity to breathe, God is returning also their own self-identity. He's returning their own character. Now let me give you an illustration of what I mean. How many of you have ever seen that little clip of the assassination of John F. Kennedy? The Zapruder film. You've seen that, right? Now let me ask you, you see uh, the limousine turning onto Elm Street, right? And you see uh, John F. Kennedy and uh, Jacqueline with her, uh, you know, pink dress, and they're greeting the people. Let me ask you, when you look at that clip of video, is John F. Kennedy alive or is he dead? You know, I, I asked that question in a confusing manner on purpose. Because some people say, well, he's alive. Other people say he's dead. Well, the fact is this, folks. The movie was taken while he was alive. But we are looking at the movie after he, did, after he died. Are you with me? In other words, on tape he's alive. But the review of the tape takes place after he died. So let me ask you, is there a certain sense when you watch that event of the life of John F. Kennedy and when you see him still alive before he was shot, let me ask you, are you really watching him alive? Just like it was? Yeah, absolutely, you're watching him alive. And so let me share this. When the righteous appear before the judgment bar of Christ, there's a certain sense in which they appear there alive. Now, don't misunderstand me. How do they appear alive? Because God took a movie of their lives while they were alive. So when the judgment comes, what does God bring? The record in the books, or whatever way that God reserves or preserves a record. And God shows the heavenly tribunal all of the life of that person inside and out while that person was alive. So let me ask you, in a certain sense, are people seeing the life of that person when that person was alive? Absolutely. But we know that it's being, re re it's being reviewed when? After they died. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So when scripture says that all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, how can the dead appear before the judgment seat of Christ? They appear through the record of their lives. They do not appear there personally. They appear there through the record of their lives. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So all must appear. The judgment's in heaven. It's before the second coming. What about the dead? Well, they're decomposed on planet earth. They can't go to heaven in a rocket to, to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The fact is that they appear through the movie of their lives. Now let's read Revelation 20 so that we understand how this process takes place. Revelation 20 verses 11 and 12. Then I saw a great white throne. By the way, this is after the millennium, but the principle applies also to the pre-advent judgment, the judgment before the second coming. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. 
Now notice this, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. How can dead people stand before God? In the light of what we've studied, when it says the dead were standing before God, what does that mean? It means that those who are on earth, dead, are standing before God, how? Through the record of their self-identity, or the record of their character, which is contained in the books. And so it says, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. If they're standing there in person, why would you need to open books? Books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Are you understanding what we're studying? Now, we have some things that we still need to cover. Let's talk a little bit about the process of the judgment when our name appears before the judgment seat of Christ. Let me ask you, what is it that our life is going to be compared with? With the law of God, right? Notice James chapter 2 and verse 12. Now we're talking about what happens when our record appears in the heavenly court before the second coming of Jesus. James chapter 2 and verse 12. It says this, So speak, and so do, as those who will be judged by what? By the law of liberty. In other words, our lives are going to be compared with what? With the law. Now let me ask you, when our lives are compared with the law, how many are not guilty? <laughs> well, let's go to Romans 3 and verse 10 and we'll read verse 20 and also verse 23. Verse 10 of chapter 3. As it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. Verse 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And then verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what does the law say to everybody who comes before the judgment seat of Christ through their records? The law says, you are all what? You are all sinners and therefore you deserve what? You deserve death. Notice Romans 6 verse 23, for the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. Do you see how difficult this situation is? You see there's no one who never sinned. So when we appear before the judgment seat of Christ, through our records in heaven, whether we're dead or whether we're alive, the records are what are looked at in heaven. When we appear there, our life is compared with the law and our lives are full of sin. So the law says the wages of sin is death. You must die. And who's there standing to accuse us? The devil is. Notice Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1. Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to do what? To oppose him. So in other words, in God's great tribunal, when our life is examined, everybody is guilty. So you say, how in the world could the judgment be good news? Ah, now let's go to the good news. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus came to this world, and we studied this when we, know, when we analyzed the everlasting gospel. We notice that Jesus came to this world, and he lived the perfect life that we should live. And Jesus died the death that we should die. And we, when we repent and confess our sins and trust in Jesus and bury our sins in the waters of baptism and we confess our sins, the Bible says that God takes the life and death of Jesus and He credits it to our account. Now is that good news? Notice 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 20. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 18 through 20. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Notice we weren't redeemed by silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you. So what happens when we confess our sins, when we repent of sin, when we claim the righteousness of Christ, when our heart is right with the Lord, what does Jesus do? He records the sin in the heavenly books, but next to the sin he writes the word 
forgiven through the blood of the Lamb. Is that good news? So when our name comes up in the judgment, are our sins in the record? Yes, everything is in the record. So some people says, say, wow, if the sins are in the record, wow, that's, that is, is, that's bad. You know, because how can I be secure about salvation if my sins are written there? Listen, folks, if your sins are not there covered with the blood, they're here. See, we need to have Jesus as our advocate. In other words, if we sin, as it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. See, our, our judge and our lawyer is Jesus, and he's righteous. And he appears before the Father, and when I repent and confess my sin, Jesus says, Father, Pastor Bohr has repented of that sin, he's confessed that sin, I claim my blood in his behalf. And the Father says, I accept your death in place of his death, and I accept your life in place of his life. Is that good news? But if we don't place our sins in the sanctuary through repentance and confession, then those sins are where? They're upon us. You know, some people say, oh, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, they don't have any assurance of salvation because they believe that all these sins are written in the heavenly sanctuary. Praise the Lord that they're written in the heavenly sanctuary. Because if they're not in the heavenly sanctuary covered with the blood, they are where? They're upon us. Notice 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now listen to what I'm going to say. In the sanctuary there were two services. There was the daily service and there was the yearly service. You can read it in Leviticus chapter 16. Do you know what happened in the daily service? In the daily service you have forgiveness for sin. Notice that 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse the sanctuary from sin? No. To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The daily service cleansed the sinner from his sin, but then the sin was transferred where? It was transferred to the sanctuary through the blood. Let me ask you, did the Israelite have to be afraid because it was transferred to the sanctuary through the blood? Absolutely not. He could have the assurance that his sin was covered by the blood. It was very safe to have it in there. It was unsafe not to have it in there. Are you following what I'm saying? But all of the sins were placed in the sanctuary, so there came at the end of the year what is known as the Day of Atonement, when all of the sin that had entered needed to what? To come out. And that's what the judgment is. You know what the purpose of the judgment is? It's not to inform God. God knows everything. Let me ask you, are there many Christians who appear to be good Christians, but really they're hypocrites? Jesus spoke about those, didn't he? So if you look on the outside, you say, oh, these are exemplary Christians. But you see, when the books are open, it will be shown who truly repented of sin, who truly confessed sin, who truly claimed the righteousness of Jesus, who truly buried the old man in, baptiz in baptism and truly resurrected to newness of life. The purpose of the judgment is to reveal if repentance and claiming the blood was genuine or not for the good of the inhabitants of the universe that don't know everything like God knows everything. And so you have the daily service which cleanses the sinner from the sin and you have the yearly service which cleanses the sanctuary from the sin. Now this is the marvelous news. If our name comes up in the judgment and when my name is, uh, is looked at and all of my records are looked at, if it's revealed that I repented of sin and I confessed my sins and that I claimed the righteousness of Jesus and that my old man was buried in the waters of baptism and that I truly resurrected to a new life and that I hated sin and I loved, it, loved the Savior, then what's going to happen is my name is going to be retained in the book of life and I will be found in Christ because when I receive Jesus Christ I am in him see I no longer appear there on my own I appear through him and that's the reason why in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 15 through 18 we find this very interesting passage about the resurrection 
It says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Let me ask you, where are the dead when Jesus comes? In heaven? No, they're in the grave. Now if they're, if they're in heaven when they died, what are they doing in the grave? It says that they're in the grave, and Jesus comes. Now do you notice here that it says the dead in Christ will rise first? Let me ask you, when was it revealed that they were in Christ? In the judgment. It was revealed that they truly repented of sin, they confessed their sins, they claimed the righteousness of Christ, they buried the old man, resurrected to newness of life, hated sin, and loved the Savior, and then you will find the book of life in Christ. And therefore when Jesus comes, He's going to resurrect them from the dead, because they are not in themselves, they are in Jesus. Is this good news or what? Now I want to share with you a very interesting experience. You remember the experience of Saul of Tarsus? He was a nasty character. Notice what we find in Acts 26, 9 through 11. Here Saul is describing his life. He says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Was he a nasty character? He sure was. Did he have a record of blood in his heavenly records? He most certainly did. But then he had his Damascus Road experience. And do you know what he did? He got baptized. Notice Acts, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Notice what happened when he was baptized. Obviously he must have repented and confessed his sin before. Notice Acts 22 and verse 16. Here Ananias is saying to him, Arise and be what? And be baptized, he's saying to Saul of Tarsus, Be baptized and wash away your what? Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Let me ask you, what happens when the record of Saul of Tarsus appears in the heavenly court? Does God look at all of the sins? Does God hold all of his sins against him? All of those murders, all the people he put in prison, all the people that were whipped as a result of him? Does God look at any of that? No, that all was forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the judgment reveals that even though Saul of Tarsus was a nasty character, he deserves to be saved because he is accepted in the Beloved. He is looked at through the life of Jesus and through the death of Jesus Christ. You know, it's going to be wonderful in that great day when uh, Saul of Tarsus meets Stephen. Oh, I want to be there just to see that. It's amazing. The last thing that Stephen saw was Saul telling the people, throw the stones, kill him, kill him. And so now you can imagine, Stephen doesn't know that Saul of Tarsus is going to be saved. So you can imagine now, uh, you know, when we get to heaven, here's Saul of Tarsus walking down the street of the city, and here comes Stephen walking from the other direction, and Stephen, I know I got, I got resurrected eyes, but are you Saul, Saul of Tarsus? You're here? Yes, the grace of Jesus redeemed me too. Listen folks, there is no record of sin so terrible that cannot be forgiven if we truly repent and confess our sin and claim the righteousness of Jesus Christ and are bury it in the waters of baptism. There is no sin so great that God cannot forgive it now and then eventually erase it from the sanctuary because it has been cleansed by the blood. Now I want to give you an illustration. We only have a very short period. An illustration that will help you remember this forever. I want you to imagine a computer. A computer is a, is a material object, right? Does a computer have a brain? Of course it does. What is it, what is it that operates all the functions of the computer? Memory. Okay, memory. In order to have a memory, what do you need? A brain. I'm, use, I'm speaking figuratively. I know it doesn't have a brain like we have a brain. But it has to have a centra, center of operations, doesn't it? Now, let me ask you, does the computer need to have a power source? 
in order to function. Yeah, so you have the material computer, it has this central processor that allows you to perform all of the functions, and then you plug it in and it has the power source. Now let me ask you, what happens if someday the roof of your house falls while you're gone and it smashes your computer to smithereens? You say, wow, what a problem. But it's not necessarily a problem. Because if you've backed up the information on a disk, you can get another computer and you can transfer the identity of the first computer to the second computer. Can you make the second computer the same as the first computer? You most certainly can. Can you get one with greater memory? Oh, with greater capacities. Yeah, absolutely. You can get a much better computer. And all you do is take what's on the disk and you transpose it to the new computer. Do you know that's exactly what's going to happen with those who died in Christ? They died and their bodies and their brains disintegrated in the grave. They were unplugged, so to speak. No power. But when Jesus comes, he's going to give them a new body, a new computer. Then he's going to take what's on the disk, and by the way, it's going to be what's on your disk in heaven, minus all of the sins that were blotted out in the Day of Atonement. In other words, he's not going to give you back all of your bad record, he's going to give you back your record, all the good things, without the bad. And he's going to take that on this, he's going to input it into you, and then you're going to resurrect, you're going to be the same person that you were, but perfect, without any record of sin in your life. In other words, the computer of God, when he examines your record, has a delete key. And as he goes through the record of your life, he's going to delete all of those things that you repented of, that you confessed. And when you claim the righteousness of Christ and buried your life in the waters of baptism to resurrect the newness of life, you are accepted in Jesus the Beloved. Let me ask you then, is the hour of God's judgment good news? It's wonderful news as long as we have repented and confessed our sins.